I'm Scott Allen Miller. It's the 5th of September, 2023. This is my vlog of daily life living in Leon, Nicaragua. And today I'm out for a walk early in the morning because I was sent out to do some scouting on some, some businesses. And I don't normally get to go out walking this early, but it was like, oh, there's some places we need you to go. So I'm just heading out and going for a walk. And I'm recording this before I even have a topic for the day. Not that it matters, because I just ramble on anyway. So we're going to get to it right after the bump. It is just a beautiful morning. It's pretty early, it's just after nine, which I mean, it's not that early, right? But it's early for me to be out walking about and getting some exercise. So I don't normally get to get light from this direction. Getting up and recording early in the morning is just, it's hard for me. I get up, I do morning coffee with the family. We hang out for a little while. And then I gotta show this, I don't know why these are here, but blankets, first of all, are not that common here in Nicaragua, but these, which are hanging on the highway, are, it's a funny spot. But these wild patterns are really common in the Nicaraguan markets. We refer to them as Nicaraguan fabric because when you go to the market and you try to get uh, blankets, like you just want a normal, plain, simple blanket, what is this? You, uh, you have a tendency to only have options of these really wild patterns, like the flowers and stuff. And we're like, why do people want these wild patterns on blankets? Like who takes the time to make these? But they seem to be popular here. There's what, it's what sells quite a bit. Now I'm not sure if it's like intentional, like they're like, yes, this is what we need. Or other places make the blankets and these are the ones that no one buys. And then they ship them here super cheap as like seconds or you know whatever uh, overstock and then people just buy them because they're the lowest price ones i don't know but there's a lot of these specific types of patterns that we can't imagine why anyone is intentionally making in the first place it's very weird so that's something you will see a lot if you go to buy a blanket here and you're not like ordering something special or going to like a really expensive department store you're likely to find a lot of blankets that are like that that you're like what now I mentioned this on the video a week ago when we did the tour of the house in San Mateo, but the secret to having frequent small power outages, and in this case, a little bit larger one, enough that one of my neighbors said, this is the biggest outage I've seen since I've been here. Uh, it's five hours, it's planned, so we know pretty much what's going on, but the secret to leveraging it is having a plan in place of what to do. For us, that is getting coffee up the street, running to Managua and doing the shopping while the power is out, and for me, because someone had to stay home and the power will be on pretty soon, so I will need to work when that happens, using the opportunity to get some videos done. I can't upload while I'm doing it, and I have have no way to cool off the cameras extra fast by using the air conditioning like I normally do. So I'm a little bit more limited, but I am able to get some things done. So I'm doing as much as I can and keeping it practical. That's how we do it around here. I really uh, need to start using more, but I am working on it, using a notepad that I keep by my computer, like a physical old fashioned notepad, where I just jot down notes. I find that the pen and paper, because I grew up on pen and paper, makes it easier for me to take notes than using the computer. And I'm able to take show notes and then cross things off as I do them. And I think it helps me get episodes and topics out for you guys uh, quite a bit more. So that is, that is something that uh, I think is a really good thing. So this morning, uh, one of the things I did that the power was out is I've been uh, very lax about this. We had a computer, our video game computer, the one that we shipped in a couple years ago from the US that the kids use all the time for their big video games. They have like laptops and stuff for smaller things like Roblox, whatever. When they're gonna play something really big and they need all the power, or we're gonna play as a family, we use the big computer. They also have a small one that they now keep in the room. They kept it in the living room for a while. We can move it back and forth. They use that quite a bit, um, but it doesn't, you know, it doesn't have the giant eight terabyte drive. It doesn't have the, the super fast GPU, uh, but it uses much less power. And it's very practical for day to day gaming. Uh, but our big one, that had to be repaired and we had gotten it repaired and when we got it back, the hard drive didn't work. And it took a bit of uh, looking and I figured out that they had messed up the cables in it, but we thought they had pulled them out and put other ones in. I was talking to Janet from the channel yesterday and we were talking about our experiences with the uh, with the computer store that did that and how they're not very competent and they're constantly selling things that people don't need and, and whatever. And I said how this happened and, and I was trying to describe 
how weird it was because there was no financial advantage to them in making my computer not work. It clearly made them look incompetent that they had a computer that worked when they got it. It was there for a cleaning, let's be clear. And when I got it back, it did not work. So that was a bit weird. That's not a good sales tactic in general because I'm not very likely to go back if they don't know what they're doing. And it's not just that they messed up something on the inside that can happen, like these things happen. But they didn't check the functionality of the computer before and after and delivered it back to me as if nothing was wrong because they didn't know that there should have been multiple drives. They didn't know what, you know, they just didn't know what was going on with the computer because it was all a little bit too advanced for them having two hard drives. Uh, so I understand that they have very little exposure, very little experience, extremely little training. And so there's a lot of, it's very easy to get caught off guard by something that's slightly out of the norm, but this was not something that should have caught anyone really off guard that a drive was completely missing when they knew there were two physical drives in the computer. They took them out, cleaned them and put them back in. So I stopped and said, wait a minute, this doesn't make any sense that they would have taken the cables out. They would have really known they took them out and throwing it away and replacing it would cost money, which is not something they would be likely to do. And the reason, so this is really important. That computer has this really big problem where it has a type of drive that needs to have a cable snipped. It's a weird problem and I don't know how the industry ended up in a situation like this where the power that's supplied by the power supplies doesn't work with the drives and when it goes into the drive there's too much power and it kills the drive. It doesn't damage it, it just hits a kill switch and shuts it off. Well that's super weird and should not be how it works, but it is. And so the fix is you have to know that you can go in and snip one of the cables and then without that extra power the drive will work. Super stupid. And there's no simple solution to this. You can't just go out, you probably can, but you can't easily go out and buy a correct cable for this. And it's not the kind of thing you can put a cable in because it's your power supply uh, provides standard power and the, the drives require non-standard power. It's the stupidest situation, but it's something someone who works in computer repair should know because it's relatively common uh, in large drives, especially those used in video gaming, especially a few years ago. So. This is something I did in the past, back when we lived in Texas, I went in, I snipped the cable, got it to work, and everything has been fine until they took it out and suddenly it stopped working. And when I looked at the cables, the cable was no longer snipped. So we made the assumption that they had uh, replaced the cable. However, talking with Janet, it made so little sense that they would have done that without charging me for that. Had they done that and charged for it and said, oh, it was broken, we fixed it. Okay, I can see where that would have been a sales tactic, but that didn't make sense here because they didn't charge for it and they didn't mention it. So I said, wait a minute, maybe somehow the, the correct one is still in there. So I went in and uh, went through the, the computer and found that they had taken the, the working one, buried it completely, put in new restraints inside the thing, little, little harnesses to hold back the cables. And they're all hidden within the, in the, uh, the case. And instantly I found the snipped cable. They had switched which cables were being used and hidden it so far out of the way that without taking the computer apart, I had no idea it was still in there. So I took everything apart, moved it around, and I think the computer's working now. I can't test it because the power's not on, but it looks like everything's back to normal. The computer was working other than that one drive when we last tested it, so it's not a big deal. Now, that leads me to why do we take the computer in for repair in the first place? Repair. This is important to note if you're coming to Nicaragua, the dust here is much more extreme than anywhere I've ever lived. Uh, when I live in the US, you can use a computer for years and it's recommended to clean it out, of course, and I work in IT, so yeah, we clean out computers. But two major things. One is that it's harder to get canned air here. In the US, you can go to any store and pick up canned air. Here, while it exists, it's hard to find. I have no idea where to buy it. Um, and two, here you need to blow out your computer every few weeks, most likely, at very minimum every few months. They recommend completely taking your computer apart and cleaning it thoroughly every six months, which is what we had them do. That was very expensive. I can do that myself. I don't need them to do that. And I don't need the problems that it causes. And really canned air would pretty much do the trick. But the situation is ridiculous and you would never think of it. Coming from someplace like the US or Canada where there just isn't that much dust, the idea that your computer is going to fill up with so much dust that it's going to stop working in a matter of months would never occur to us. But when they open up the computer, it is such a mess. Like, yep, the problem is it's overheating in seconds. It never has time to, to actually turn all the way on. It's got so much dust caked on everything. It just heats right up because not only is it dusty, but the environment is warmer. So the combination, and of course there's high humidity. So everything, you know, sticks to the inside of the computer more than it would uh, back in the US in, in, you know, the Northeast or Texas where I've lived. And so it was so dramatic that the computer completely died from all the dust. 
got it all cleaned out, works just fine. So that's something you need to know if you're gonna be living down here with a computer, and it's good for everyone. Clean out your computers more often. That's a fire hazard, people. It's not good for your computer. It doesn't help it live a long time, doesn't give you the best performance. So clean it out, get more from your computer just in general. But if you live in Nicaragua, make it a scheduled maintenance thing. Every six months or so, assume you've gotta have canned air, you gotta open it up, you gotta take the time to really get everything cleaned out, move cables around, blow everything out, get every, every heat sink and everything really, really cleaned off, you will get much better lifespan out of your computer, much better performance out of your computer, and you won't risk or have a high risk of it completely shutting down from overheating due to all the dust. Also, if you can run in a filtered air, air conditioned environment, that's gonna be that much better. We were not able to do that for a really long time. Now here at this house, we're going to be able to do that. So we're gonna get a lot more time out of the computer uh, without having to do that. And we're gonna make a point of finding compressed air so we can keep it clean all the time. Uh, those are things that uh, you just need to be aware of when you're using a computer here in Nicaragua. So I'm out recording in the heat of the day at about two o'clock in the afternoon in ultra bright sun as one does. I mean, when's better to come out and do videos outside in Nicaragua than at two o'clock in the afternoon at 34 degrees and incredibly bright sun? I, it doesn't get any better than this. So welcome to the great outdoors. My morning when I did the an announcement right after that, I actually ended up being able to save a puppy. I'm very glad I was out for a walk this morning because this little, maybe five month old pit bull puppy that I actually recognized ran out to where I was or was in front of me. I, I caught up with it and she got in front of a bus. I mean, so close to getting run over and she had her leash still on. So she clearly had escaped from someone who had been holding her. And so I, I sped up, I tried to get to it. It was so, it was so close to hitting the bus. Like, oh, my heart just stopped. This sweet pit bull puppy. She is so adorable and so cute and so just loving and loves people. And uh, some, luckily the bus stopped. Some kids got off the bus. She ran up because they were children. And of course they were terrified of her. They're all screaming and trying to get away. And this dog just wants, you know, it's a puppy. It just wants someone to play with her. There's no aggression at all in this dog. And um, because there were kids it slowed her down, she went to see them. And then I came up and she recognized me and she ran up to me and rolled over on her back for me to pet her belly. So I rubbed her belly and I grabbed her leash really quickly. And I'm like, okay, I gotta, I gotta walk this dog back. Because if you remember uh, my episode where I talked about, there's a field where uh, I asked permission. I was out filming and the guy came out and he's like, what are you doing? And I'm like, oh, I have a vlog and I'm, I'm recording my vlog here because it's like a nice light and, and open space and stuff. And he's like, oh, cool. I'm like, is that okay? He's like, dude, yeah, fine, whatever. And uh, so I have this field that I can use. Of course, right now they just freshly planted it. So I don't go in there because I would be trampling on their plants. But when it's uh, cut and it's just waste time and they're waiting for it to dry, then it's perfect that I can go in there and record. Uh, so this is his dog. So luckily I knew the dog, she knew me, she rolled over, I was able to grab her. And then a few seconds later, this like, I'm gonna guess 12 year old, but I have no idea. A uh, girl came running down the street. She was exhausted and panicked. She was obviously the one who lost the dog. I think it's his daughter. And uh, I was able to give the dog to her and she was able to carry it back. It was a long way from home and certainly not going to survive the morning. So I was very glad that I was out there to do that. And she is now fine and a very sweet dog. And hopefully she will come visit us on the show sometime. This is a new spot for me to be recording and I got some great views of the cows behind me. This is actually a gorgeous little spot and I have a nice tree cover. So it's really hot out, but it's relatively comfortable where I am. And actually I'm gonna take a picture while I'm recording. I'm gonna talk and take the picture so I can show the picture all at once, which is kind of an interesting thing to do, I think. So you can see what I'm seeing as I'm seeing it. So here we are, this is me actually taking the picture. Let's see what looks good. Oh, that's that's kind of... All right, you'll be able to see that and see where I'm standing and what it looks like. I also need to get a picture down this way because it's pretty cool. There's a church down here, down this really nice little path. And it's kind of a cute spot. It's kind of an unmarked dirt road that kind of goes into this really small community here. I am west of Carlos Canales. I think this is part of Inferanito, but I'm not sure. I haven't checked a map, uh, but I just wanted to stop because I need different locations and really, this kind of stuff gives you a feel of what a lot of Nicaragua looks like. 
you know, a lot of the times I'm showing the same places because they're convenient for recording or close to where I am or en route to somewhere else or just a quiet place. Here is a place I've not been, but a lot of Nicaragua looks like this. A lot of these little fences, some some cows milling about, uh, very rural. There's some farm areas, dirt roads. There's a lot of this that I think people don't picture at all as being, being Central America. And even for me, having lived here for years, when I walk around, sometimes I take these paths and I'm like, wow, this could be this could be a back road in in middle America somewhere. And it's just farmland and beautiful and trees. And, you know, we don't get the fall colors here, but you can almost picture it because the trees do lose their leaves on a regular basis. So today's topic, uh, a couple things that I wanted to cover. One is I get a lot of questions. So a couple things, I, I want to do a little housekeeping. The first thing is, for those of you who've been mailing info at Relocate Nicaragua, Dot com. Uh, thank you for doing so. I'm very bad at keeping up with that. Part of the problem is it goes into my uh, main work email and it's very hard, one, to segment that and keep track of it, but also uh, I found that that email is very bad for that type of correspondence. Like the email system just makes it very hard for me to figure out who I've spoken to and what the thread of conversation is. Like there's something about the way that the email is being handled in there that it's it's really difficult. I'm not sure what's going on, but it doesn't matter. What I'm gonna do is um, Nika Mail is a new mail service here in Nicaragua and I have an account there. I'm gonna move uh, the Relocate Nicaragua email over to that and separate it from my, my regular everyday work email so that when I get emails there, it's it's just a different system. It's gonna be much easier for me to keep track of who's talking to me, know when there's a new message and get back to you guys or whatever. So I'm gonna I'm gonna do that. I'm also gonna work for people who actually, you know, if you just have a casual question and you just wanna say hi, like whatever. But if you're if you like need a regular correspondence, I'm gonna to try to move people um, to dicaabla.com, uh, which is a more of a like Slack if you're used to that, and it allows uh, for those of you who are looking for consulting or end up wanting consulting. Um, that's how we do phone calls and video calls from this region and screen shares and that kind of stuff um, and it's all free like just I, I'm gonna do that so it's much easier to be like oh I need Scott I got to ask him a question that way I can be sitting at dinner and be like oh someone's asking me a question and just respond whereas with like email it's much harder to do I have to figure out what's going on and who's responding it's just I'm gonna try to simplify that workflow so I actually get back to people so a few of you waited a really long time for me to get back to you a few of you got pretty quick it's just kind of I got once I get behind it gets really hard to keep up and it's very hard to figure out what I've responded to and what I've not. And and sometimes people are like, oh, you missed something. And sometimes I'm like, I, I can't find the original thing that you're talking about. So I don't know. I, I probably did. I just, I don't know. Um, so that's a little thing I'm going to try to change um, on the day that I'm recording this. I'm actually recording on Sunday. Uh, so that's, I got to pause. I've got my workout watch going. And uh, so that that's one thing. I also went through and did a bunch of cleanup this morning um, in real time that on, on comments on on the vlog because there's a lot um, of comments that sometimes require an answer and I'm like I, I can't research this at the time I'm reading it and then it's very hard to find the thing again so sometimes it get lost and like yesterday's video that was quite delayed by the time I made the video by like a month right so that's I'm trying to avoid some of that and there's a ton of old comments and a lot of the ones that are really old are ones that are not so bad as to need to be deleted but they're bad enough that they need to be addressed, like just people making up stories or putting in ridiculous comments or saying really stupid things. So there was a ton from like seven months ago, right? That were just obviously ridiculous. People trying to fear monger, trying to say that like someone made the claim that there's there's like assassins who live in the country and use this type of local snake that is relatively dangerous and uh, throw it into people's houses. And in the night, the snakes takes out the entire family. Like, really? That's a weird thing. You'd think you would hear about that. And how do snakes get under the doors and stuff? Like, that doesn't really make sense. And uh, how do you know the people like it's just so much to go wrong? As a potential, you know, professional assassin, uh, if I play through those things, it feels like that would be a really stupid way to kill people. And so I did some research on the snake, and it turns out that it has a, a fatality rate of approximately 0%. It's not actually zero. There are a few people who have died, one of them being a researcher of that type of snake. Like, he just got bit too many times, apparently. But it's not a snake that actually has a kill rate. Right, it did prior to 1947 when they found the cure for its venom. They made its anti-venom. And so since that time, basically no one has died. There's one guy, one kid in Ecuador who they forgot to treat him and he went weeks without treatment and he lost part of his leg, which was tragic, like seriously tragic. The doctor totally mishandled that, didn't give him anti-venom, pretended that antibiotics would do the job instead. They do not, poison is not a, is not a bacteria. Um, so like that kind of stuff, but 
Like people were putting these stories in to try to scare people. And, and he made, uh, this is crazy. He said every single person he knows in Nicaragua, that's quite a statement. Either you've lived here and know nobody, or you know all these people, and you're saying every single one of them has had armed home invasion with people with AK-47s. It's amazing considering I've never met a single person who had an armed home invasion. Of course there are, right? Nowhere, not even Nicaragua, is so safe that it'll never happen. Even like Romania has had it happen, but it's very rare. For someone to have that invasion and have an AK-47 is nuts because one, AK-47s are super expensive. If you can afford one, you wouldn't be involved in a home uh, a home invasion. That would make no sense. It's not like the United States where you get an expensive gun and use it to rob people of a lot of stuff. Here, you would have the really expensive thing that no one could afford and use that to rob people of almost nothing. That would be insane. Only a complete idiot would think that that could possibly make sense if you had lived here and knew how expensive an AK-47 was and how cheap the things in people's homes were. Uh, plus, it's not like they're taking the expensive things like, you know, a fridge or the oven. Maybe they could get away with the TV. Maybe. But the chances that you could wield AK-47s, multiple ones in the, is how he worded it, and steal a TV, like it doesn't make sense. And the chances that you don't get caught, the chances that like it's just economically as someone robbing your house, it doesn't work. I also have never met or heard of anyone who has an AK-47. Like they exist with like security companies. They're very rare. Guns are relatively regulated here. They're not loose, right? There's not a bunch of people running around with weapons. If you did, you'd have money from other sources and you wouldn't be robbing people of their TVs. Like, it doesn't make any sense. He also claims that it was every person getting this armed robbery. If every person he knew was getting this armed robbery, how is anything functioning in society? Like, that doesn't make any sense. And considering we've lived here for years and never met a single person who had an armed invasion, we do know someone in the relatively close area on Western Leon that had a home invasion. Right. I also know people from Western New York. I grew up in the countryside, not a city, way out in the country. I had friends that I went to high school with who had an armed invasion. They were taken hostage. They were tied up. They were gagged, left like, like, like you see in the movies. I have friends who had that happen. And I went to a really rural high school in the middle of nowhere. And it wasn't like a big thing, but everyone knew the story. Right. And it was a one off. And it was not something you could go around and be scared of every day. That would be ridiculous. But here, you know, it's we live in a much bigger place. People assume this must happen so much more. And the reality is, is it can still happen, but it's so much less. But I don't know that it's an armed invasion, but certainly not an AK-47. In both of these cases, if you were caught with an AK-47, they wouldn't need to catch you with the TV that you took. You're toast. If they caught you with these snakes he claims people has, it doesn't matter if they know you killed someone or tried to kill someone with them. You're toast. A lot of these things are like really illegal to possess because they have no legitimate reason. So like these stories that people tell, no one's even like, this is common. When people are putting really wacky stories into the comments, like here on YouTube, quite often when you read it, you're like, wait a second, this doesn't hold up to any scrutiny. Just common sense says this story doesn't make sense. And of course he combined it with like, he was a personal, you know, like he's a ninja or something crazy. And he, you know, he doesn't need weapons, but other people do. And he can fend off a machete with his bare hands or whatever. And that's other things. If you were going to rob a house here, an AK-47, and again, like he claims to be military. He claims to have all these friends who are like international assassins. And like, they're like, you know, British MI6 type military, but they operate here in Nicaragua and instead of using normal weapons that are effective they use snakes with no fatality rates like what a weird story that is um and and then you know if you're thinking about like armed invasion if you were an armed invader the first thing you wouldn't do is carry something worth more than what you could possibly steal so carrying an AK-47 if anything went wrong and you had to ditch it you would lose more money than you could possibly make in robbing many houses. That's a huge risk that a robber would never take. If you carry an AK-47, you are at huge risk because that is not a weapon that is useful in a home invasion. All right, so this tells us, like the person telling this story who claims to be military isn't even casually familiar with weapons and how they work. This is like the story a five-year-old tells, right? Oh, I heard about AK-47, so I'm gonna tell this story. Everyone who's bad has one, and that, like this is a very American story, right? Everybody's got an AK-47, and that's what they use to rob you on the street. Do you know how ineffective that is at close range, which is what you are in a house, especially houses here, which tend to be a little bit smaller than you're used to in the U.S.? That enclosed space makes an AK-47 
really useless if you're up against, and you likely would be, someone with either a much smaller weapon, like a handgun, if you were to, to run into someone with a weapon like that, it would almost certainly be a handgun, which will be much more wieldy within a house. You'd be in, in really tough shape just to defend yourself against someone with a, with a pistol. But even more so, as cops are trained, this is standard training. If you're in an enclosed space and you have a pistol or something, let alone a shotgun or a rifle, if you in any way have to point and shoot and your adversary is at close range, especially in an enclosed space and is wielding a machete, your only recourse is to run because the chances that they're going to disarm you, and by disarm you, I mean remove your limbs that are holding the gun is so high. The chances that you will get a shot off, while possible for sure, is unlikely. And if that, for that shot to land and you know, disable the person who's defending themselves, not very likely. You're almost certainly going to lose an engagement at close range with a machete. And guess what percentage of houses here have machetes at the ready? It's a pretty high percentage. So you would be carrying the least effective possible weapon that costs the most possible money into a scenario where you're not just essentially guaranteeing, not really, but taking a really high chance to the point of it being likely that the person you're going to assault is going to be in a position to remove your arm below the below the elbow and steal the weapon that you just went in there with, you will lose thousands of dollars and your arm. And then there's almost no chance you're going to get away because you can't go to the hospital without the police finding you and you're going to bleed out. Every piece of that story is so dumb. Even five-year-olds would struggle to put this story together if they thought about it any. But this is the kind of stuff that's in the comments, so I just wanted to... It's entertaining, right? But that was seven months ago, and I saw that, and there was, there was a whole bunch of these like this from the same person. And every one of them had the same, like, incredible stuff that's completely backwards of, like, real life. It's very weird. Uh, next thing he's going to tell you is like he lives in Nicaragua and everyone he knows is so rich that they all fly around in flying personal vehicles like, you know, super drones, like those things are just claiming they're inventing in Japan that no one's actually seen yet. I guarantee at some point there's going to be a post where he's like they everyone in Nicaragua actually has those. Everyone's secretly super rich and they're all armed with like military grade turrets and they fire on anyone who comes near them. That's that's pretty much in line with his other stories. So I just wanted to share that. All right. Today, we're gonna actually talk about, now that I've done that housekeeping and gotten that off my chest, because it's a funny story, right, is uh, we're gonna talk about um, dating in Nicaragua. So we're gonna get up to that in just a second. And, and this is a, a topic that's a little bit challenging, right? I don't want to, um, it's easy to go into discussions that are not appropriate. I wanna keep this a family friendly channel and uh, people often ask these questions for less than genuine purposes. So I'm gonna to try to keep this general and useful for a majority of people. And there is, I know a lot of legitimate people moving to, I mean, anyone who moves to a country for the purpose of living there, um, who, you know, has the feeling that, well, I may be giving up on dating because I don't know if there's even the possibility of it when I get to that country. I don't know how to do it. So maybe I'm giving up for a few years as I learn the culture, whatever. There are people who are doing that or, or considering doing that. A lot of the people who are moving here are families. They're not looking for any kind of like that kind of social interaction. They may be hoping to make friends with like the neighbors, maybe have someone to go have a beer with at the local bar or whatever. But there is also a lot of people who are potentially looking to move here or anywhere else and are hoping to potentially find a romantic partner, someone to share their lives with, um, or are simply giving up because they think that's something they can't do and that they wanna move here regardless. So that's, I really wanna address kind of what that very general scene is uh, for everyone so that uh, people don't have to ask me directly as much as possible, because I know it's an uncomfortable question potentially, and I want to um, provide that information because I think a lot of people are actually wondering um, and it's also one of those things, like if you were to describe dating in, say, America, other than, well, it's very toxic, there isn't much that you can say about it because it's not a very general thing. It's something that is very difficult to talk about because it's so personal and you don't necessarily have a lot of insights into other people's interactions. Um, so the same thing here, the generalities that we have to use are quite large and it can be very difficult to explain in a useful way, but we're gonna do our best and hopefully provide some information that people need. So the first very general thing is, you know, you're moving to Nicaragua and you wanna know if I move there and we're 
just going to make some assumptions like that you don't live here already. So you're moving here from anywhere. And the question is kind of, do I have the reasonable possibility of being able to go out and meet someone, whether it's using a dating app or you're going out to the bar, whatever, just the very general sense. Could you potentially meet someone, take them out and, and have a date and potentially have it turn into a relationship? That's more or less the base question. And so the very simple base answer to that is, yes, absolutely, this is a normal society, there isn't anything weird about it, and people are generally open to dating people who are foreigners. And importantly, it doesn't require everyone in society to be like, I want to date foreigners. If, you know, foreigners here, expats specifically, make up a very small percentage of society, and they make up a very small set percentage of the people who are tourists. Uh, and when you put that all together, there's not that many uh, people who are from elsewhere and here, first of all. And then the percentage of those people who are interested in, in actively dating in the country is smaller still because many people move here and are not dating, right? So when you put those numbers together, the number of potential expats living in the country who might go out and try to date is extremely small. And so even if your percentage of Nicaraguans who had that natural or semi-natural uh, um, interest in dating someone, we'll just say exotic, someone from another country, someone from another culture, someone potentially from another race here, the you know, races relatively even throughout the country. It's kind of mixed of indigenous and Spanish colonial population throughout society. So you, you have this uh, semi-uniformity and people don't tend to see race so much as we do in like the United States, where the United States doesn't have a real blended society. It has a lot of different, we call it the salad bowl in the United States. Like you got lettuce and you got croutons and you got onions, you got tomatoes, but they stay separate. Whereas in most of Latin America, what you end up with is much more of like uh, um, a dip, right? Where all the different ingredients go together, got mixed together, and you have a sort of uniform society that is a blend of its majority source uh, groups. It's a weird way to describe people, but it's important to understand that our American perspective is not the norm throughout the world. It is not completely abnormal nor completely surprising, but it is not the absolute standard worldwide. It is not how most societies end up working. And so here in Nicaragua, you end up with uh, a relatively homogenous, very relatively homogenous society uh, who then, if you're coming from North America, for example, you are likely to be seen as somewhat exotic because you don't fit that homogeny of the local group. And so any group anywhere in the world is going to have a certain percentage of the population, whether it's 1%, 10%, 90%, who find people from other groups attractive or at least somewhat interesting, that they're going to at least see them, oh, that's that's interesting. Like the, I, I'm just as happy dating them as, as you know, someone who grew up in my hometown. Um, but there's an awful lot of people, and this comes from, you know, DNA, like healthy DNA is encouraged by this, where people are like, there's a cow walking by, and uh, uh, they say, ooh, this person is completely different than me, and they have a natural attraction because of the difference, all other things aside, right? Just the fact that that person is from a different place. And you have the same thing in America, but because of the salad bowl effect, um, it's not nearly as strong. But as an American, or, and you can do this with any culture, like, do the experiment in your head. You don't need me to explain it. Uh, if you're from America and someone moves into your town and they're from France, they're from Russia, they're from Angola, they're from Korea, South Korea, right? Any place. And they come, they have an accent. They have a cultural history that's different than yours. They've lived in a part of the world that you haven't. They grew up in a completely different environment. They are clearly a different set of DNA than you. There's a really high chance, again, whether it's 50% or 90%, that if you were to take their overall level of attract attractiveness to you, right, you like people who are tall, short, whatever, and they match that or don't, whatever they are tends to be enhanced by the fact that they are different than you. That exoticism tends to be a little bit of an attractor on average. And so the same thing happens here uh, because there are so few foreigners, because many Nicaraguans never interact with a foreigner, let alone potentially date one. Um, that gives a certain like, well, I'm willing to give this a try. This is something completely different. I, I don't know until I try, right? And and it's uh, just interesting. It, it adds an entire point of interest. And so that alone causes uh, expats who are living here to have a little bit of an advantage or just an overall entry into the dating pool in general, because before people know anything about them, 
you're offering this alternative perspective of the world that Nicaragua being such an insular society, not intentionally, right? Not like the United States where you have a very insular society intentionally where people could travel, but decide not to, where people could learn about other cultures, but actively avoid it. Here in Nicaragua, people really want to travel, but have a lot of barriers to that, mostly created by the US, right? Most of the flights go through the US at some point, the US will not give transit visas to Nicaraguans under normal circumstances. So you have a society that has very few options to travel because most flights are blocked uh, by the US or Mexico uh, because their borders are uh, physically constrained by partners that make it difficult for them to travel overland. Uh, they need special visas to go absolutely anywhere, including their neighboring countries. Imagine if you lived in the US and you couldn't fly anywhere or you're afraid of flying and both Canada and Mexico decided that under normal circumstances they would close their borders to you you'd be relatively trapped, but in a really large country. Here, people are trapped in the same way, but in a very small country with a very small population. So their availability of seeing the outside world is very low. Dating someone or going on a date with someone, just hanging out with someone who's from another culture can represent a really big opportunity uh, for a lot of people here to interact with the outside world in a way that they're often unable to do so uh, if, by simply choosing so, right? They can't just get in a car, drive to Costa Rica, for example, even though it's right there. Costa Rica requires a visa that is very hard to get for Nicaraguans. Not impossible, but, but quite hard to get. And so, and it's very costly to go to another country. And given that Nicaragua is relatively poor, on average, the average person is going to struggle to do those kinds of things. And so beyond anything else, before we talk about anything with dating, before it's gender specific or anything of the sort, just offering the perspective of another culture means you are automatically at least somewhat interesting and certainly more interesting than you would otherwise be all other things being equal to Nicaraguans on average. Like you just have that leg up. And so that is going to, to give you an advantage in a dating pool where you, you might back in the United States be like, ah, you know, going out is very difficult. I find it very stressful. People don't want to talk to me. I'm not interesting. I'm not saying people on my channel are not interesting, but you know what I'm saying. And, and dating in the US, you know, super toxic, very hard. So you do that here. I think you're going to find, oh, whatever you had somewhere else is now an advantage here, right? And the fact that you may not speak Spanish in some cases may actually make it easier. Obviously, on average, if you can speak Spanish, I guarantee that's going to make it even easier. But there are advantages to not speaking Spanish, like this whole like, you know, hey, uh, th there's a reason why I'm not explaining myself. I'm from somewhere else. You're from here. You're cute, whatever. And let's get coffee, right? Um, that's all you need. And some people will be like, ah, oh, well, who knows? We'll get coffee and, you know, whatever. So that as a starting point, I think should be very encouraging to people that if that's something you're concerned about, uh, the ability to take someone out for coffee and simply introduce yourself and get to know them a little bit better is very accessible based solely on the fact that you're not from here. Another big factor is that the natural or assumed financial disparity is going to work in your favor. And this is not really a good thing, but it is reality and it's worth noting. The general assumption, and this is almost always correct, is that the, the person who is moving to Nicaragua is doing so that they are moving from a more affluent society, from a country where the income rates are higher. There's, and then that they are above average affluence because there's two factors here. One is that Nicaragua is the poorest country, at least by GDP, within the Western Hemisphere. So, uh, and certainly compared to all of Europe. So if you're coming from anywhere in the Western Hemisphere other than Nicaragua or from anywhere in Europe and potentially from many places in the rest of the world, China or Japan or South Korea or whatever, chances are your income level uh, is simply higher than nearly anyone you're going to meet in Nicaragua. Certainly not than everyone, but far above the average simply by being from that other country. Just the way that it works, there's, there's very little chance around it. So there's a very good chance that your income is going to be dramatically higher than the people you meet. That is compounded by the fact that you are now in another country. So if you are an American, for example, or Canadian or Western European or Mexican or whatever, chances are you're starting with a higher uh, just an average person in those countries starts with a much higher average uh, personal income rate. If you then say, well, of those people, the people who are interested in traveling took the time to actually do it, went so far as to not just travel, but to actually relocate and have the financial ability to do so means you're 
you're taking the poorest portions of whatever country off the table. You're, you're leaning towards more affluent from those countries. And so when you do that on top of the other economic factors, the chances that you're going to have a higher income than the people you meet, and by more than, say, 5%, but much more like 30% or, or much higher, uh, is very high. Very, very high. So uh, what in, uh, say, the United States, you have a financial hit traditionally to dating, right? And it doesn't matter which side of the table you're on, people tend to pay for their own dates. And so, so if you're going Dutch in the United States and you decide to go out for dinner, that dinner might cost 30 or 40 or $50 and take an evening of your time that you otherwise could have spent working or relaxing or whatever. That makes any given date a big time and financial commitment that can be a little bit rough. Here in Nicaragua, a lot of factors play into this that change that dynamic significantly. The first is that it is assumed, and you should assume that as the expat, I assume that's who I'm speaking to, that you are going to pay for anything that you do. It just makes sense. And it doesn't matter if you're male or female, assume you're going to be the one paying because of the incredible disparity in finances. And it's good to do so. And we can do a whole talk. If people have questions, get down in the comments, let me know. Do you feel uncomfortable with this? Let's talk about why, because I have talked to a lot of people who come here and they, they say they feel uncomfortable with this. And I think with some financial explanation, it's easy to be like, okay, that actually makes sense. This is the way it should work. And, and it just, it's not something to worry about. It is a different call. There's so many factors that make it different that the things that make you feel good or bad about that coming from someplace like the United States shouldn't apply here. And it's important to let those emotional burdens go because they're not applicable. So the first thing is that uh, for the person who is here, for the Nicaraguan, who's being asked out, or maybe they're asking you out, the opportunity to go out with someone who's exotic and interesting, that's one thing. But you also present an opportunity for them to go out and maybe it's just get a coffee, or maybe it's to get dinner, or maybe it's to go see a show, or whatever. You're going to take them to the movies. You're going to get popcorn and soda. Not a big thing. And for them, it could easily represent a night out that they couldn't do on their own. Not that they couldn't do that one specific activity without you, but they can't do it as often as they have time to do. So if you offer to take them out, and it doesn't matter, bowling or the whatever, that's an extra opportunity to go out that if they weren't going on a date with you, they often would not have been able to do or it would have been very costly to do so and it would have come at the expense of something. So for them, the date itself offers time to go out. As Americans, we tend to look at it very differently. Dates tend to use financial resources and tap us. And so uh, people who are dating tend to be very wary of going on dates that they don't feel have been re very heavily vetted because they don't have the time or money to waste on that. Here, it's the opposite. Even if they were uh, very unlikely, like, I'm not, I don't know, this person isn't my type, they're not, I don't know, like, I don't think, oh, but I'm gonna get dinner. Well, I'm gonna get a dinner out of it. I'm willing to give them a try, right? It changes, changes that dynamic significantly in your favor. It is also important to note that the cost of taking someone out here is dramatically lower. In the United States, if you're going Dutch, for example, you're each paying for your own date, it's easy to spend 50 to to $100 on your portion of a date. And then they spend that much. You're both committing, right? The, the asker and the askee. There's a lot of, of financial and time commitment to going out. And here, a really nice date might be $15 or maybe $25. And on, you know, 40 would not be completely unreasonable. But that's where you're paying for both people. It's a completely different dynamic when you're saying, I'm gonna spend $50 for the right to sit here and talk to someone I don't know if I'm interested in, or I'm gonna spend $30 and I'm going to get a dinner out of it, and I'm going to maybe have a conversation with someone I'm interested in, but they are going to get a benefit out of it too. They're gonna to get a meal, they're gonna get an evening out. So they benefit, I get something, I spend less, for both parties, it makes the idea of going on a date completely more accessible and less scary or less of a burden. So it's important to understand that every aspect of the economics of dating is completely different. And now let's talk about time. For many of us who come from North America or Western Europe, our time at home is considered very valuable. And going out at all, whether it's on a date or just out with friends or out on our own, is something that we do 
cautiously. It's something that we we dole out our time to do that in very limited fashion. We tend to like to stay home and watch TV or play video games or do whatever. And certainly that can be the case here, but much more generally, Nicaraguans don't tend to have a TV at home. They don't tend to have video games. They don't want to stay home. They want to go out. And one of the things that they hope for in dating is simply excuses to go out and be out uh, and, and do entertainment. That is considered the entertaining thing, being around people, going to see music, going to see a show, doing things out and about. And Americans used to be this way before going out became too expensive. And so we started focusing on things that were very cheap to do while staying in our houses. And so that changed in American culture and in Canadian and Western European dramatically. Far more in North America than in Europe, though. Europe going out remains much more accessible than it does in, the, in North America. And, and you notice that in every aspect of the culture, right? You go to Italy, like going out to dinner doesn't cost anywhere near as much as it does in the US. And it's not a, how fast can I get people through the restaurant experience? It's a, I'm gonna sit here all evening and enjoy some wine and enjoy some food and just do this very relaxing thing where I hang out with my friends and I hang out with my family and that's our evening. Right, and it's a totally different feeling because going out is the is the objective. And in the United States, getting fed and getting home is the objective. And here it's much more like Italy. You just don't linger over dinner in the same way where you're on a, on a hilltop mountain town and you're staring out over the valley and you're slowly sipping your wine. That's unlikely here. What you're much more likely to do is have a pina colada sitting on the beach or go to a restaurant where there's live music and you're having a beer while watching the live music. But the vibe, the underlying, we're going out and being seen and being with friends or being on a date and being social outside of the home is the norm. That is the goal. That is what makes people happy. So because of that, the time commitment of going out on a date is often seen very differently. Instead of uh, it being, I'm taking away from my time to watch reruns of Friends at home, which is what I plan to do. Instead, it's, oh, I didn't know how I was going to afford to go out tonight, or I didn't know who I was going to go out tonight with, or I wasn't sure where I wanted to go. And so because of that, it, it is in, instead of a taking away from someone's home time, you're helping give them their out of home time. And so it's it's a benefit in that way. And so that also changes the dynamic significantly. So you put these things together, whether it's time or culture or opportunity, exposure to the world or financial, all of these things get flipped completely on their head compared to what most people are accustomed to who watch my channel, who are coming from North America or whatever. And it creates this completely different world where, um, you know, in theory, and, and we'll talk about where you might be able to meet people quickly in a minute, but it changes this entire dynamic from going out and meeting someone being a very hard thing where you have to, if you're the one who wants to meet someone, you have to get over this barrier of your own time being wasted or money being wasted or stress. And you have, they don't have those things. They're like, oh, this is a great opportunity for everyone. Everyone's in a better position here when you're talking about expats asking out locals or locals asking out the combination of locals and expats. And so it's, it's a very different experience. And people coming from, say, North America may have an idea of small pieces of that, but not understand or see or be prepared for just how many layers of that uh, kind of natural meshing between expats and Nicaraguense is likely to exist, it feels like, well, you're an outsider, they have established culture, there's all these things, and uh, it's not, not doesn't really work that way. It's also worth noting, the majority of people who ask this question, you can assume are going to be men, because men are much more likely to ask, what are my chances of being able to date, whereas women have a much more, what are the chances someone's gonna ask me out? Right, like it's just an average, but that, that tends to be where it is. But the majority of people who have broached this question with me uh, have been men, and it is worth noting for men that it is uh, even easier dating here because there is a lack of men in the country. You've, we've talked about uh, on a number of occasions why the real estate is so low here, uh, why the growth rate is so small in Nicaragua right now, and a lot of it has to do with the fact that so many people have migrated from Nicaragua to Spain, to Panama, to Mexico, to the United States, to Canada, uh, to a few other places. There's been a mass exodus out. Costa Rica has a fair number. and. They're out looking for jobs, they're out looking for opportunities and planning on sending money back to Nicaragua. 
Probably, and in some cases they've just left looking for another life. And those are huge numbers, right? We're not talking about 10,000 people. We're talking about many hundreds of thousands of people, almost all of which are both of dating age, because they're in the, the main working age pool, and male. So the ratio of men to women in the country has skewed significantly and continues to do so as, as dating age men from roughly 20 to 50 flood out of the country in hundreds of thousands per year or in excess of 100,000 per year and women almost entirely stay behind. Not entirely, there's, it's, there's some blend, but the vast majority leaving are men. And so the, the actual demographics of the country have skewed to where the percentage of, of women versus men in the 20 to 50 year old age bracket is far off from what it would normally be in a normal, healthy, no one's dying of weird gender-based diseases society, uh, and no one's had an active war during the current generation. So that alone makes it for the majority of people who are coming and asking the question, what is their situation? It is so much better simply because there are a large number of women in this country who are lacking in the availability of potential uh, partners, whether you know long-term or just dating or whatever, simply because there aren't as many people as there should be. I really like this view of Cerro de Oro right here. That is the extinct volcano that I climbed in an episode about a year ago with my broken foot. Uh, so then the question becomes, how do you meet people? What do you actually do to go out and make contact with someone uh, that you're you know, potentially going to be uh, interested in. Well, a lot of this is gonna depend where you live and what you do, how your lifestyle is, but the basics are not too hard. Uh, unlike the United States where going out and meeting people in public can be extremely difficult, that is not a problem here. For all the reasons that we just mentioned on why dating makes sense, the same thing makes it easy to meet people, and that is simply that everyone goes out all the time. So whether you're single or, or married or dating or whatever, chances are you're going to be out and about and doing things in public. So if you're interested in meeting someone, it's not very hard. You simply go to where the people are. That could be going out to the beach and hanging out on the beach. And then after the sun goes down, Go do the activities on the beach, maybe go to a bar, go to a place of live music, go to a dance club, right? That, that's the beach thing. If you're in a city, then go out to your local bar, go out to restaurants, pay attention, go to you know clubs. There's a lot of places where people go out live music. You can go to carnivals and such, and it's really not hard to meet people and make an introduction and say hi to people who are standing in line with you at a food cart, just whatever. You can go to parades, you can go to church, if that's what, is that your thing, right? People meet people, everywhere and people are very social here. They're very open to simply talking to you, right? You wanna have a conversation with someone new, you generally can do so. It's a very different approach. You don't have that barrier where people are like, I don't really wanna meet new people. I don't wanna talk to you. That would be very common in the United States. Here, if you start talking to someone, they may not be interested, but they're not going to be offended that you tried to talk to them. They'll be flattered or just disinterested or whatever, but the chances that someone will be actually interested is relatively high. So it's something to consider that you have to really change your brain and say, I can just go out and meet people, um, however. And of course, dating apps exist here as well. So I know a lot of people use those and with success rates uh, that are nothing like the United States, right? Where, you know, everyone talks about how it's really fake and the whole thing is just bots and it's all just a ploy to get people to send money. Here, uh, people that, you know, Everyone knows people who have met on dating apps uh, and frequently, and, and it's a real thing, right? People actually use them, real people actually use them, um, and it's a, it's a way to make introductions, especially if you, I assume, live in the very large cities, you're probably gonna have a much better success rate uh, than in small communities where uh, chances are anyone you meet quite distant from you. If you're in Managua, you'll have a much better chance in general Right. However, if you're in a Managua, you're in a Leon, you're in a Granada, you're gonna have a lot of other expats there and people are gonna have a lot more exposure to, well, I've met other expats and it's gone well, gone poorly, I'm over it, it's no longer a novelty or whatever. Whereas if you're in a small community, a Nagarote, an El Viejo, uh, whatever, somewhere very far out from the main cities, or even a Matagalpa or Hinotega, which are fair-sized cities, 
you are likely going to be very unique and the number of people that you will meet will that will have ever met a foreigner let alone had an opportunity to go out for coffee with one will be very low and your success rate based on that alone will likely go way up you you simply offer an exoticism that is accentuated by that rather than minimized by the big cities the traffic is picked up on this road a lot when i started there was like no cars at all and now it's like constant so i'm stuck pausing over and over again as they're so loud so uh going out simply going out and going places and being willing to talk to people is enough that you're probably going to meet someone and even if you don't walk up and find the person that you're directly interested in chances are you're going to make friends by going out you're going to end up hanging out with people and those people can find out oh you're you're potentially looking for someone i may know someone right so don't don't feel discouraged that you're just making friends and not finding anyone that might be a romantic partner if you have friends here and express an interest in potentially finding a romantic partner there's a very high likelihood that they're going to know someone and be like oh i totally know someone who would love to go out and meet someone new and and you know give it a shot right so it's uh, and that is true in the u.s as well but i feel like in the u.s you tend to find um, a much higher rate of people who are uh already married and very stable um, and here and this is an important part of the culture the even uh nicaraguans who are who are married they use the term married very differently and this is not universal but it's it's relatively high uh they use the term married differently than in normal spanish language they use the term esposo and esposa uh, especially in smaller villages especially in rural areas and this takes a while and it really takes you by surprise when you find out what's going on um, they use novia and novia novio and novia which are the normal spanish words for boyfriend and girlfriend to mean something a little bit more casual more like this is a person i'm dating than this is someone i marry than i'm really in a relationship with and they use the terms esposa and esposo which we normally associate with husband and wife or reversed uh to mean more like in, in the 1960s in the United States, going steady, right? Like it's more than just a casual dating relationship. You're now in a serious dating relationship, certainly a really serious one, and one that almost certainly implies that you're living together, but it does not imply that you've had a marriage ceremony or have any legal bindings to each other. This comes for two reasons. One, because it's simply the culture. People tend to be a, quite a bit more transient here. So we see people who who say that they're married, esposo and esposa, and have been together for years, but very casually then move on and date other people and, and, and just move on. Um, that's one piece, that just the long-term stable relationships are less a focus, um, but also as a culture, because traditional marriage is a religious thing, it is very much something given to us by the Catholic Church and is itself not exactly an institution of the state, here in Nicaragua, there's a very high uh, uh, pressure towards using marriage as more of a uh, state of being rather than a legal state. So it's much, much less likely to have paperwork involved, cost involved, or register with a religious authority. When you do go through those extra steps, like we were at the, the wedding, the boda, a few weeks ago for our friends that was done in a church, that was a full wedding like we would have in the United States under the Catholic Church, and registered with the state. The registering with the state, not very important. They don't really treat marriage as anything very big here. Like you can be married, not married like on paper. It doesn't really matter very much or possibly at all. Whereas um, with the church, it's a really big deal. So if you're Catholic, for example, you are likely to actually want to get married and have a priest oversee it. But if you're not Catholic, you very likely are like, well, that's a Catholic thing and I'm not Catholic. So that would be sacrilegious. Like even suggesting it is kind of religiously odd. Why would I perform something for myself that's a ceremony from a different religion. So there's a lot of just people don't do that. They simply declare themselves married and work that way. And society has mostly adjusted to that. But so it's an important thing to be aware of that someone may say those terms and may not mean what you think. We hear it all the time. We'll have friends who say, oh yeah, this is my wife. And then you find out that they've been together for only six months and uh, they're not actually married. They're just very seriously dating and have recently started living together. And you're surprised later when you're like, oh, I thought they were married for a long time. You're like, oh, no, they're not actually married. Like, it's just, just something that someone says. And I have talked to people who have used expressions like, I met this guy yesterday. We're married. 
we live to like all the like they live together they they got a pet together they uh are they're married all these things and it's combined with i met him at dinner last night and so there's this and it's not a one-off this is a very common thing to hear uh that one's a little bit extreme but it's it's this kind of mentality of like we went on a date it went really well we're now married that's our thing is surprising in how often this happens or something similar to it and so you will you'll often meet people who are like oh yeah we we're we're married and they don't know each other right they have a, only a passing knowledge of each other maybe they grew up in the same town maybe they're you know could be anything um the dating life from what we've seen here moves extremely fast um people tend to go from oh we met at a bar to going out on a date to either not being interested in each other or to being very interested in each other and considering themselves married over a period of days or weeks, not over a period of months and years like we're used to in North America. The uh, you have to get on with life and, and be who you're gonna be mentality here, totally different. And this is a great example of what I mean by Nika time, right? In the United States, we talk about uh, how things are done on a schedule and we feel, that makes us feel culturally that we do things very quickly. And here in Nicaragua, they do what we call Nika time. And even Nicaraguans often refer to it as things taking a really long time, but that's not how it works. Whether it's a plumbing thing or a dating thing, it is that they take action right away, but it's unpredictable. In the United States, we buffer things. So we say, we're gonna, we're gonna plumb your house on Tuesday at noon. And they're gonna show up Tuesday at noon. And then they're gonna very slowly plumb your house. And if you're dating, you say, well, we gotta go six months and then maybe we'll get engaged and that will be for another six months and after a year, we'll get married. There's like this, there's like a, a schedule to it. And so when you do get married after a year, you say, whoa, they're right on time. Yeah, but it took a year. They they delayed for a year to be able to say they're on time. On time, yes, in, in that sort of scheduled sense. Whereas in Nicaragua, they're gonna meet and potentially say, we should get married. And that's the end of the discussion. They say yes, and they're done. And so they move on with being married right away. And then when they're done with it, they move on from being married right away. And th that is so different than the experience in the United States. And in the United States, we really don't let people say, I'm married when you're not by a church, but why, I don't know, because it's just a religious thing that somebody assigned rules to, and they are not rules from any particular authority uh, and so why, do, like, it's all very weird. It actually makes more sense here in a lot of ways, um, but it's so outside of the norm that it's often very confusing. So something to be very aware of that you will likely constantly be surprised by that um, and find it very hard to read scenarios and know when people are very officially married versus just casually saying they're married and what dating really means. Do they mean that they've been out once or twice? Do they mean like it's a serious thing and they're committed? Who knows? Those things can be can be very confusing, um, but be aware that things can move very quickly. But also because of that, people tend to be transient in relationships. People will move in together and move out, uh, sometimes quite rapidly. And so uh, don't be surprised if the dating pool is larger than you expect, simply because there's more people transiting through it on a regular basis. Whereas in the United States, if you're gonna go out like the pool of people at your local bar, who are single, of course, will change from night to night. But overall, if you go over a period of months, you're not gonna meet a lot of new people because it's the same people constantly going out, going, I hope I meet someone. Here, you're much more likely to have a, well, they came out and they were with someone a week ago, but now they're out and they're single. We also have the thing where there are people who go out when they're both in a relationship and not in a relationship. Again, in North America, while certainly married people go out, committed, relationship people go out, we often see the idea of leaving the house, at least beyond getting fast food dinner, as being something you do to meet other people. Here, going out is considered just a thing you do. You're social regardless of your marital status or your dating status. And so there's all, you know, just because you end up with someone doesn't stop you from having the lifestyle that you like to have because it's not a, I'm going out despite the fact that I wanna watch Netflix or play video games, it's that I wanna go out, I don't wanna watch Netflix or play video games, and so whether you're single or married, you continue as a couple, or singularly, singularly, singularly to do the things that you like to do because it's what you like to do and it's what you culturally do. That's a lot of information on dating. Um, it's gonna be difficult to extrapolate that into something really useful, but rest assured, if you are interested in meeting people and it doesn't matter if you are uh, you know, 18 or you are 70, 
coming here and putting in an effort to go out and, and be social and meet people is going to give you a really good opportunity to potentially meet someone. And if you put in a little bit more effort and make it not just go out socially in the, in the general sense, but try to make friends, just, just any friends, make friends, become involved, get to know people, they will pretty much guarantee you can meet someone. Uh, if you go to places like dance clubs, you're going to up your chances of meeting someone dramatically. And in all my time here, I've not yet met anyone who was actively putting in any effort to try to meet someone who did not meet multiple people, that that is just something that is feasible and realistic and appreciated because there are many people here who are Nicaraguense who are interested in meeting people from other places just because it's a whole opportunity for something interesting to happen uh, that otherwise wouldn't exist and it's a little bit of, you know, added flavor to the spices of life and uh, so that's uh, not something that you should be afraid of. It's not something that you should be super concerned about. I do want to preface this with, or, or post fix this with a, uh, an epilogue, I guess, um, that there is a well-known set of scams that often happen through romantic entanglements anywhere in the world, but Nicaragua does have a reputation for this and you need to be careful uh, just be wary that uh, just because someone talks to you at the bar does not mean that they're, you know, altruistic and just hoping for the best for you. There is a possibility that they're interested in you because you have money, because they perceive you as having money, because they're going to, uh, you know, uh, scout out, you know, your, they're going to scope your house and know what, how much stuff you own. They're going to figure out how to get into your house. They're going to, you know, steal your wallet while, while they're there, whatever, right? There are horror stories. I don't know any firsthand. Um, when we lived here eight years ago, I dealt with some, you know, living in Granada where you get the worst of the worst, right? That's where those things happened there and in San Juan del Sur. Uh, there were a bunch of old Canadian guys and they all talked about how they let their guards down, ended up dating a local and ended up, you know, doing something very foolish and having all of their life savings stolen um, because they, they really didn't think things through and didn't protect themselves in any way. Uh, and that can happen. And that can happen anywhere. And it does happen anywhere. It happens in the U.S. It happens between Americans all the time. Um, here, there is a little bit bigger risk of it, and there is a very high uh, additional chance that simply um, someone who's local may see the opportunity that otherwise doesn't exist and can't resist uh, the potential for, for uh, improving their life. Um, they may be pressured by family who don't know you, have no personal relationship, and are just like, do the right thing for your family. Um, there may be a, you know, animosity towards whatever culture that you're from that they're able to hide, but they feel good taking advantage of you because of it, just as Americans take advantage of people from other cultures all the time. Those things are potential factors, and you simply need to be cognizant that you protect yourself and not let your guard down completely and say, ah, it's such a perfect world, because it is, it's paradise, and the people are wonderful, and there's such a good chance that people are such good people that you can forget that there are still risks, right? You're not gonna get home invaded by a group of people with, with $10,000 worth of AK-47s so that they can steal your television worth $300, but there is a potential for people to look to take advantage of you, especially casually, if you put them in a position where that's really, really easy to do, and uh, just be aware that that can happen, but I say be much more careful that you don't let the idea that something could possibly happen drive you to avoid being a good person with good behaviors simply because you're afraid of what could happen no matter how unlikely it is that is a terrible way to live and you will regret it when you have lived a life of unhappiness unnecessarily thanks for joining me like and subscribe Put your comments down below, scroll down. Have you dated here? What have been your experiences? Are you looking to date? Don't get weird about it. Just say yes or no, or you know, saying you're looking for a life partner, or you're just hoping someone will go out to the movies with you or whatever. You're hoping for someone to be able to take to four by four races in the mountains because you don't want to go by yourself, or you know, and of course, maybe you're just looking for an opportunity to meet someone and, and be a, a positive impact on their life while getting a cultural experience that only someone really close can give to you, that kind of, like whatever. Get down in the comments um, 
please no questions about where people are. Oh, there's the bus going to my hotel. That is awesome. That's like 40 people on their way to my place. And, uh, uh, you know, no questions about age gaps. We're not going to answer like age gap questions. We're not going to answer hiring people questions. We're not going to answer. Uh, there's just a lot of things we're not going to talk about um, where it's easy to meet like by city. Like some of that stuff's weird, right? Date like normal people. Um, obviously, there's if you're looking for other things, research it on your own. Um, but this is this is generally a family friendly channel. So we're going to keep it to that. I hope that information is useful to everyone. Uh, but definitely get down, leave your comments, ask your questions. Have you, you know, ended up in a long term relationship with someone here? Did you meet them here? Did you meet them before you got here? Did you come here because of them? Um, did you get married here? Is it is it soft married? Is it like full on legally married? Is it like all those things? I want to know uh, what because I know a lot of people who live here and a lot of Nicaraguans watch the show. So I want feedback from all those angles, everyone's got good information to have on this, so I want to hear that. And as always, share with your friends, tell your family, post on the social medias, not the R Nicaragua subgroup on Reddit, they'll just delete it. Uh, but otherwise, put it on Facebook, Twitter, all those things, and I will see all of you tomorrow.